if we if we do have a long drive, we shouldn't come in. We we uh, they didn't recommend that we did that, and so uh, I took I'm taking full advantage of it, you know, and just uh, doing class from home today and other work as well. Let me check, make sure everything's happening here. All right, and. Um, Let's go to the Prezi. By the way, I hope you uh, have been able to access Prezi um, <clears throat> uh, in order to uh, remind yourself of something that's been taught in class or um, whatever. Um, let's see. I think I may have too much going on here with a with a Teams meeting as well as a live stream on YouTube, but uh, hopefully my little MacBook will catch up here. But you can already see um, the uh, week six title here, the teaching process. And uh, I'm going to yeah, it's moving slow. It's moving slow. I'm going to go back here to change this to the computer and screen. What does that say? YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, I think what I'm going to do. Let's see. Let's just I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but I'm getting an error from YouTube. Looks like maybe it's working okay. Just moving slowly here. I think I might nix the Teams meeting. Yeah, just because it's too much. But uh, <clears throat> regardless, here we are at uh, week six, the teaching process part one, and um, intro to teaching. That's not what I want. What am I doing? I need to click on week six. All right, here we go. The teaching process. What needs to be done before we begin teaching? So, so um, <clears throat> we're going to spend a couple of weeks here on process. And um, uh, essentially, I want you to begin thinking about these three questions. What needs to be done before we actually ever begin the actual teaching, the actual classroom, the actual small group, uh, what, whatever, whatever forum we're teaching in, what needs to be done beforehand? Um, no doubt a few things come to your mind. What, what about uh, what needs to be done while we're actually teaching? You know, and, and think about the, uh, the things that you, you uh, have to do actually, you know, during the the actual act of teaching. I keep using the word actual a lot, but um, like like right now, I'm having to deal with uh, live streaming and, uh, and the presentation and, uh, you know, what I'm actually going to say and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, working, m making sure that the, the Prezi uh, presentation is moving along as it should and, you know, whatever. 
um, what needs to be done while you're actually teaching. You know, you need to be uh, aware of of um, of uh, you know the the the, the audience's reactions, uh, the uh, you know possible distractions, um, whatever. Um, what needs to be done while we're actually teaching? Uh, then. Final question: What should we? What should be done after we have taught? Are there some things that a, that a good teacher will do after the lesson has been taught, after the the discussion has been had? Uh, are there some things that we should do after? So this is where I want to go today. I want to start though by talking about assignments four and five. In um, in Canvas and uh, you know from the syllabus assignments four and five and we'll get there in just a second but basically you're you're up you, you get to teach in in just two weeks from today and uh, then we'll talk about the teaching process before during and after okay so let's start here um, with uh, just being clear about about uh, these two assignments numbers four and five. Actually, number four is broken up into two parts. The first part is a teaching plan. The second part is the teaching outline. And then uh, in two weeks, assignment number five is to actually teach a Bible lesson. And so I'm going to open Canvas here. And we're going to go to the, the teaching plan assignment, uh, assignment number four, part one. And uh, let me just walk you through this, and, and hopefully it, it answers whatever questions uh, you may have. Uh, I can see now that that uh, part of this is is uh, in, in need of being updated. So I'm going to do it live. I'm going to um, I'm going to take uh, this updated version of what online students need to do. And I'm going to paste that in here because that changed and I did not remember that it needed to be done over here as well. And that's not the same color. And I don't like that. And I'll go down here and save this. And now we'll talk about it, okay? So uh, assignment number four, part one, prepare a lesson for various teaching situations. Okay, so you're going to choose a teaching situation and prepare a 10 to 15 minute lesson on a topic or passage from the Bible. Uh, so uh, this first part, this first part of assignment number four, part one, is... Uh, to to develop a plan. So uh, you're going to answer the following questions to, to help you prepare for this for, for what you're going to teach. But this is for this plan part of it for sign for part one of assignment four. You're just going to answer these seven questions. Okay. So first of all, who is your audience? Just pick one. Okay. You're not going to your audience is not going to be uh, the teaching the Bible class, the, the, the students who are in class for teaching the Bible. You're going to pick one. You're going to pick your nephew's children's church. You're going to pick my, my church youth group, my church small group, my grandparents' small country church. Um, you know, uh, maybe um, you get a chance to lead a Bible study in, in, in a prison or whatever. I don't, I don't really care. You, but you have to be specific. You have to pick an audience and describe them in this assignment, okay? And that's that's actually very helpful. Uh, whenever you speak or teach or lead a discussion, is to is to think about who's my audience, who exactly am I dealing with here? You know, like I've said before, like if you're if you're leading a small group discussion with with uh, sixth grade boys, you're probably not going to want to dig into the Greek very deep, deeply, um, but you know, who knows? Maybe with your particular group of sixth grade boys, they're 
they're prodigies and they love that stuff. Who knows? But you have to know your audience. Number two, what is the situation? Why are you teaching that audience at this time? Are you going to speak at a funeral? Uh, is it a uh, just a, a regular small group uh, meeting that you that you lead every week? Uh, is it uh, um, you know that the, the the normal ministry leader is on vacation and they've asked you to fill in? Are you candidating for a ministry position? Uh, what is the situation? You decide. You tell me in this plan that you're going to create here. Okay, number three, what decisions need to be made based on the audience and situation? What, what, uh, you know, as you describe this audience, uh, number three here is to tell me what, why that matters. What, what decisions have to be made? Um, you know, uh, say, um, you know, am, are you going to use PowerPoint? If not, why? Are you going to give handouts? If not, why? Are you going to um, sit in a circle? Are you going to uh, have them, or, or will they, will your audience be sitting in pews or rows of chairs? Um, how, will that, how will that affect uh, the situation? Um, you know, if, if the situation is that you're uh, speaking at a funeral, you know, um, Tell me what decisions need to be made there as far as, um, you know, uh, was this a young person or an old person? Uh, what what passages, are, you know, are, are most appropriate for that particular situation? So lots of decisions that need to be made as far as the audience and the situation. Then um, what Bible topic or passage will you teach? Why that topic or passage for this audience and situation? Just explain that for me. What method will you use to teach? Lecture, discussion, storytelling? We're going to talk about that today. Uh, that's, that's part of the teaching process. And then uh, why? why? Why choose that method? Why lecture for sixth grade boys? You know, what, Why discussion for sixth grade boys or, or, or whoever your, your audience is? Okay, so what, what method? Think about method. Jesus used numerous methods, and I'm going to show you a, a short list today. Um, but but be thinking about method and describe that for me for this assignment. And number six, what resources will you use to teach? Uh, are you going to show a video clip? Are you going to use PowerPoint? Uh, are you going to bring in uh, an object lesson? Uh, one time on Easter, I brought in an urn, uh, you know, a thing that they you know, pre-make. A human body in, you know, uh, and they turn a human body into ashes, and then they put it in an urn. And I brought one of those in as a as an object lesson on Easter Sunday morning. Long story, but uh, you know, be creative. Uh, object lessons just work, you know. And uh, um, maybe I'll talk about that more later. But but uh, what resources are you going to use to teach, and why? Number seven, what lessons learned in the Teaching the Bible class will you incorporate? Um, you must use at least three, okay? So, um, uh, for example, today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to lead a discussion. I want you to explain, if you, if you want to lead a discussion, um, explain a little bit about, uh, you don't have to write me a dissertation on this, but, but just a, a paragraph or so explaining um, um, how you're going to incorporate what I've taught in this class into how you're going to teach, okay? So I want to see that you're getting something out of the class. I want to see that you're, you're trying to apply the lessons learned in this class into the, the, the lesson that you're going to teach. So I want you to explain to me uh, at least three of the lessons learned in this class um, for how you're going to teach your your particular um, lesson. So, so this is part one, okay? And I'll go ahead and walk through um, what online students need to do here. Uh, so first of all, in-class students are expected to present your, your um, Bible lesson, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, your, your, your 
you have to present that in class unless you're sick or snowed in or you know whatever. Uh, but online students uh, should submit a video via Microsoft Teams. If you wanted to present live during this this period, Monday afternoon, uh, we might be able to work that out. Um, but I haven't noticed anybody uh, tuning in live to the live stream, so I'm guessing that that's not something anybody's interested in. But if you are, just let me know. But what we'll do here is we'll, you'll schedule a time with me. Then uh, at that scheduled time, you'll go into the Teaching the Bible team. You should have received an invitation cycle for this. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, then let me know. But then you'll click on the Meet button in the top right-hand corner. Okay, and then uh, make sure that your mic and video are on. And then when you're ready to present, you just click on Join Now. And then uh, click on the More. A this is really important. you got to click on the More Actions uh, menu, which is the three dots. And then just click on Start Recording. And then Present. Pre do your presentation. And then, uh, if you want to use a PowerPoint, you, you use the Share Content feature. And uh, when you're done, you stop the recording and you click leave, and that's all you have to do. Uh, your recording will be automatically saved in the conversation stream of the Teaching the Bible team. Now, let me show you this live, all right? So this is Teams. This is the Teams meeting. So um, you should see this MS237 Teaching the Bible team. And uh, it's, got, it's already got some videos from um, previous class times, okay? And so what you do is you come up here to meet. And remember, you have to schedule this with me because someone else may come in and want to do it at the same time. And I don't know if that would work or not. But uh, you click on meet. Okay. And then you'll probably see yourself here. All right. There. There I am. So your mic is right here. And you have to make sure that that's purpley. Uh, that that's on. If, if it's off, it'll look like that. It'll have a slash through it. You probably didn't hear that. Maybe, or maybe you did hear that. Anyway, uh, and this is where your video is, okay? And you can change the background filter to where do we want to be? We want, we want to be in the mountains, don't we? Man, that sounds good. So never mind. Oh no, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so um, you, you certainly don't need to change the background uh, for my sake. I don't care. Um, but if you want to, you know, make it real, like you're going to lead a small group discussion on a ski trip, you know, and you want to put mountains in the background, that's cool. Um, <clears throat> so then you're going to uh, join now and. Um, we're waiting, we're waiting, and it's possible that there would be some participants. No, it's just me. Okay, so this is your More Actions menu up here, and you come down here to Start Recording. You click on the Start Recording, and it will show you. Uh, eventually, yes, you're recording. You are recording this meeting. Be sure to let everyone know that they are being recorded. So uh, then you just you just present, okay? And um, if you want to um, share a power a PowerPoint or share your screen, say you want to take us to a website that's that's got a blog post on it that you think is really interesting. You want to use that as an illustration, then you can come here to share content, and um, it will give you some options. Okay, so then when you're done, you can uh, simply leave, and it will shut off the recording, and it will 
say saving reporting to Microsoft Stream. Okay, so it's not really not not really complex, but that will be an easy way for our, uh, online students to submit a video for this assignment. Okay, so that's part one, um, and and then uh, the part two of assignment four is the teaching outline. So you're simply going to submit your teaching outline for next week's presentation, and that's <laughs> those are all the the instructions that I have for this particular uh, assignment, for part two of this assignment. But if you um, are unclear about how to develop an outline, um, please let me know. Basically, you're going to start with an introduction. You're going to have the body of your lesson. Maybe that's three points um, that you want to make from a particular passage. And then you're going to have some sort of conclusion. So uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a basic outline. But if you if you uh, have any questions about that, let me know. Okay, and then the, the third assignment we need to talk about is this one, uh, Teach a Bible Lesson. This will be due the last class period, and as I've said, you can literally walk out of this class period, the last class period of this course, done. You can be completely done at that point. Um, and I hope uh, all of you will take advantage of that possibility. But here I've got uh, number assignment number five: teach a Bible, teach bi Bible lessons for a variety of learning settings. Um, I'm only going to have you teach once in this course, um, but uh, you know we'll talk about various settings uh, today and then next week, and you'll also get to see your classmates' presentations, and um, and you'll just get to consider, you know, hopefully uh, as you plan and as you do. Uh, the first part of assignment four, you'll just be thinking about the various possibilities of um, settings. So, um, so again, this one is, is this is what I've already covered. Actually, uh, in-class students must present in front of the class. Online students should submit a video via Microsoft Teams. And uh, let's see what else. The day before the last class period is the last possible moment to turn in your outline for this assignment. It is highly recommended that you turn it in on or before the seventh class period. I want to see your plan, your outline ahead of time. Ideally, you will turn that in a week before you actually teach. Um, yeah, uh, in fact, I need to require that, but I, I'm not right. I'm not this this cycle, but. Um, it would be so helpful if you can if you can do that. It'd be helpful to you, okay? And there's a rubric on this that will tell you basically how you're going to be graded, um, audience and situation appropriateness. We're going to talk about appropriateness uh, today. Topic or passage choice. Did the student demonstrate care by choosing a topic or passage appropriate to the audience and situation? Uh, method choice. Did the student demonstrate care and skill through the method of teaching? All right, so this is uh, read through this rubric yourself, and this is how you're actually going to be graded. And I'll make comments uh, as I uh, watch your presentation, um, and you'll you'll get a, a certain number of points. Okay, a possible score of 200 for this. Okay, so let me go back here to this slide and, uh, and uh, so and just say again let me know if you have any questions about this uh, let me know if you have um, any any questions about uh, how to develop an outline and um, I just I just encourage you to be as creative as possible I think it's probably uh, best for you to put yourself into a, a situation with an audience that you know is actually possible that you would uh, get to do that somewhat soon. Uh, but you know, if you if you want to, you know, choose an audience of uh, of a uh, whatever a stadium uh, full of uh, of uh, you know high school students and and you are now a, a uh, a, uh, an internationally known speaker who 
who gets to uh, speak in such venues. I mean, that's that's totally fine. You get to pick your audience and you get to pick the situation. And I would love to see some creativity with that. Okay, so let's move on and talk about the teaching process before, during, and after. And, and by the way, I am uh, still going to um, stick with the uh, break times just in case anybody is uh, watching this live stream. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and stick with those break times and um, just do this uh, normally, even though I'm tempted to just uh, get it done and, and since I'm sitting here by myself. Uh, I'm going to stick to those break times uh, for the sake of the live stream. Okay, so the teaching process. Think learning process, okay? Think learning process. Uh, let's, I've got two little um, pithy sayings here that uh, will bring this out. So first of all, if no one learns, the teacher has failed. If no one learns, so think learning process. What, we're, what we want when we're teaching the Bible is not just to teach. We want people to learn. If you stand out in a field by yourself and you teach the Bible, it's it's a waste of time. It, it might do you some good. It might be therapeutic. You know, you could probably come up with some reasons why it would be good for you to stand out in a field and teach the Bible. But, but, I mean, realistically and ultimately, what we want is for, as teachers of the Bible, is not just to edify ourselves, not to, you know, do therapy in a field somewhere. We want people to learn. We want people to grow in their understanding of what God has said. And so I'm, I'm, this may seem extreme. If no one learns, the teacher has failed. That may seem extreme, but that's not actually an original statement. Um, I, I want to reference uh, one of the great teachers of the 20th century. And uh, I'm not entirely familiar with her, um, but she actually said this. She said, if our students have failed, we are, we as teachers too have failed. Marva Collins. Who was Marva Collins? Well, I, I've got a couple of images here from the internet. Um, she wrote, uh, a book called Marva Collins Way, and she uh, and they made a, um, a a TV movie uh, based on her life back in like I don't know the 80s I think, but this is this is a snippet from Wikipedia about Marva Collins. She said uh, it says dismayed at the low levels of learning that she felt some students were experiencing in particular areas. Collins took $5,000, which was a large sum of money at the time, uh, the, the, the 1970s, from her own teacher's retirement fund and started a private school in the top floors of the Brownstone. That should be capitalized. It was a, it's a hotel, I think. In the West Garfield Park neighborhood where she lived in 1975, the school she started was called West Side Preparatory School. West Side prep became an educational and commercial success. Uh, sorry, I should say uh, Collins created her low-cost private school specifically for the purpose of teaching low-income black children whom Collins felt that the Chicago public school system had labeled as being learning disabled. Collins said she had the data to prove that students were teachable and were able to overcome obstacles of learning via her teaching methods. And she wrote, uh, she wrote at least one book, uh, and, and uh, she, she was honored by Presidents Reagan and Bush, Bush 41 and 43. And uh, in 2004, she received a National Humanities Medal among many awards for her teaching and efforts at school reform. And there's so much more. I'm not, I'm not even giving you um, uh, but, but the tip of the iceberg about this amazing woman. Um, but my point is that she said, if our students have failed, we as teachers have failed. And 
and uh, you know, remember the context here. She's talking about um, uh, low-income black kids who had been failed by the Chicago public school system. Why? Because they had teachers who were simply teaching. And according to Marva Collins, they didn't care if anybody learned. They didn't care uh, about the, the students failing because they were just doing their job. They taught. It wasn't their fault if the students didn't learn. Marva Collins said, no, if our students fail, we have failed as students, as teachers. And I, I agree with her. I think that if no one learns when we teach the Bible, then we have failed as Bible teachers. And uh, you know, maybe, and, and and frankly, I've failed many times. I have failed many times. Um, um, with with my youth groups, uh, with uh, my church, and and uh, you know, there are, there are many uh, lessons, many sermons where I believe I failed because the, the the people that were listening, the people that were in the conversation, uh, didn't learn. Um, and so the, there's also different degrees of failure where uh, sometimes, you know, it, I, I hit a home run and the people learned and, and the lights came on. And then there are other times when when uh, I just didn't get through to people. I, I didn't spend enough time, um, uh, you know, working hard and studying and being very clear about what I wanted to say. And, um, you know, I'm not discounting the Holy Spirit. We'll get to the Holy Spirit in this process uh, at, at some point. But my 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 point is that we don't we don't always succeed. Uh, sometimes that's our fault. Sometimes it's not. Um, but um, our job is to is to um, think about teaching in this way that that um, if. If somebody doesn't learn, then it's a failure. It's a waste of time. And, um, you know, I, I, I truly believe that. And so the other part of this is, you know, I want you to think learning process. And the other part is that it's a process. True teaching is a process. It's not just an event. All right? So process is an important, important word when it comes to teaching. So think of those two words. Those two words are carefully chosen. Learning process, okay? You want to teach the Bible? Think of a learning process, not just teaching, not just, you know, I want to have the coolest PowerPoints, uh, not just, you know, I want, to, I want people to be impressed. What we want is for people to learn. We want people to ultimately to grow. And, and, and so uh, think learning process, and we'll talk more about this as we go. Okay, so here's the basic process that I'm using for this course. And if you'll notice here, I'm starting, I've got part five over here um, at the first spot because ideally what's happening is that you're, you're really studying the scriptures, uh, you know, looking over a few key passages to prepare for next week's lecture. That's, that's uh, um, an intentional part of the process um, that I'm using. Okay, so then there's, uh, textbook and article reading. Um, then you complete the life development reading summary so that you can, can be clear about what the author uh, actually said. Then there's the response papers. Um, yeah, that that where you have to list facts about the lectures, the title, the author's intent, the core concepts. Uh, then there's part three, think through the issues. I'm giving you two to three analysis, synthesis, evaluation questions, you know, getting, trying to get you to think, trying to get you to, to, uh, to um, connect the dots, so to speak. And that's, that's part of that uh, Bloom's taxonomy that we talked about last week. And then part four is to apply the issue. I, I'm having you do some reflection, some journaling, some prayer, think about decisions that you need to make, projects you need to do, habits you need to develop. Uh, that's also part of the the process. In fact, I probably should include uh, in that list, you know, create something, and pro probably should make that part of your assignments to create something, to 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 write a poem, to 
um, to create some art, to paint something, to 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 um, to uh, construct something, uh, you know, uh, create a chart or whatever, you know, if you can create something from what you've uh, learned, from what you've studied, uh, then then you are you are at the the pinnacle. You are at the 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 height of being able to to say that you really learned from from uh, the lesson, the discussion, the the lecture, the, the process. Okay, so here's another way of thinking about uh, all of this process. First of all, prepare well. This is what you do beforehand. During the during the actual uh, lesson or or discussion, uh, you're going to present appropriately. This is what's happening during the actual teaching event. And then um, you're going to process effectively. This is what you do after. This is what you do after you've actually um, prepared your lesson and taught it. Okay, and, and this is really going to be the outline for this, for these two weeks of, of looking at the teaching process. Prepare well, present appropriately, and process effectively. Okay. So let's look at uh, preparing well. And I want to talk about three indispensable factors. Uh, this is inspired by one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Roy Zook from Dallas Seminary. He's now with the Lord, but um, he was just one of my favorite teachers. He was a teacher's teacher. He taught teachers how to teach the Bible and uh, wrote some great books, uh, really, really uh, helpful books. And so he, he's, uh, this is in quotes because Dr. Zook is the one who, taught, who, who wrote about three indispensable factors that I'm going to share with you in a little bit. Then we're going to talk about diligent study and prayerful creativity. So this is, these are ideas that are specific to uh, preparing well, what we do beforehand, okay? So let's look at the three indispensable factors. This is uh, from uh, Dr. Zook's Spirit-Filled Teaching book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in Your Ministry. Uh, just definitely uh, something that, that uh, all of you should read at some point. But Dr. Zook says, More pastors, teachers, youth leaders, and other church workers are increasingly aware of the fact that Christianity is, to a large extent, educational. Did you ever think about it that way? Church leaders are seeing that a balanced, coordinated, educational church program can help dispel student interest. Employing appropriate teaching techniques and using suitable instructional materials can help make teaching more exciting. But these factors, important as they are, cannot in themselves guarantee teaching power and effectiveness. Secular educators use these educational factors to good advantage. Even theological, liberal, religious educators seek to use the best in teaching procedures. There must be something else that guarantees spiritual effectiveness in Bible teaching, and which at the same time makes evangelical Christian education distinctive from secular teaching and liberal religious education. The three indispensable factors that make Christian education dynamic and at the same time distinctive are, one, the centrality of God's written revelation, two, the necessity of regeneration, and three, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. These are the di dynamics of Christian education. Okay, now let me just elaborate just a little bit on each of those points. Number one, God has given us his revelation. This is the substance of what we are called to teach. We just need to help people understand what God has said. And uh, I love uh, this little passage in Nehemiah chapter 8. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to read it here. Where is Nehemiah? All right, so this is Nehemiah 8. 1 through 8. Um, you know what? I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to go to my Bible.
the software. Put this up on the screen. Nehemiah 8. All right, and let's put this up here. Show reading view. <laughs> Everything's moving slowly today, but here's Nehemiah 8, 1 through 8. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law to Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Okay, so this is a big crowd, uh, all who could listen with understanding. So this is not necessarily children. Maybe that gives us precedent for having the kids out of the, the, the big church, you know, the adult church uh, in, in Sunday school. But uh, verse 3, he read it. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Just that picture is amazing to me. Um, this, is, this is people who had been in exile, and they were brought back to the land, and so they were ready to hear what God had to say, and to obey. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkijah, uh, Hashum, Hashbadan, Zechariah, and uh, Meshulam on his left. Um, verse 5, Ezra opened the, the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, picture this, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, and I'm not going to read through this list, um, uh, several, several men, the Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. I love this story, and uh, the, the, the reason I bring it up here is because the uh, the Levites and and uh, Ezra just helped the people to understand what God had said. They weren't making up new stuff here. They were simply um, telling them what God had said. And, and and this is what we always need to keep in mind and, and remember is that God has given us His revelation. Uh, what we want people to learn what God has said. Uh, it's not about us impressing people or or you know us being so wise and and insightful it's about uh, what god has said and if people come away understanding what god has said and they forget all about us then mission accomplished number two the goal of teaching the bible is transformed lives so the teacher must be born again regenerated in other words this is what dr zook means by the necessity of regeneration um, the, the teacher must be born again uh, and fully engaged in the process of spiritual transformation. Okay, uh, it, it, may go, it may go without saying that the teacher of the Bible needs to be uh, regenerated, but there are many people out there who are, who are not uh, saved, most likely. Um, people who say that they don't believe that Jesus is God, they don't believe that Jesus' death paid for our sins. That, you know, that, so they say many things that indicate that they don't really uh, believe and, and uh, most likely because of that aren't saved. Um, but in order for the Holy Spirit to, 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 um, to work and to, and to make 
the teaching of the Bible most effective, I believe uh, the teacher needs to be born again. Now, can the Holy Spirit use uh, a donkey if he wants to? Yes, he can. Um, but I agree with Dr. Zook that, that uh, the ideal situation is that the teacher would be uh, saved. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 2. All right, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 14. Okay, so Paul writes, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural, a natural man, an unsaved person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Okay, so in order for the Holy Spirit's work to be done in teaching the Bible, uh, the, the, uh, the teacher must be himself uh, born again and, and providing spiritual thoughts and spiritual words that come from his own uh, salvation. And, <clears throat> and I think also I would add that the goal needs to be both the regeneration of the of the listener and uh, the spiritual trans the spiritual transformation of the listener, not just you know let's impress each other with our great wisdom or or let's let's um, um, make people feel comfortable or whatever. The the goal is spiritual transformation to become more like Christ. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that. So number three, the uh, third indispensable factor is um, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Only by the working of the Spirit through the Word of God does a person truly learn the ways and thoughts of God. Uh, we'll John 2, 27 here. And if you're... Um, I, I would encourage you that, that you not just let me look these things up for you, but that you would also look them up with me as we walk through them. But he says here, John says, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, uh, you abide in him. Now, this is a complex verse. You have no need of anyone to teach you. Um, I don't think that means, you know, you don't need any teachers, you don't need to read any books. I think it just means that that I think that John is writing to people who are mature. As for you, the, the people I'm writing to, you, you you're mature enough in your faith where you can learn this yourself. You you can you can study and you can understand the scriptures yourself. Um, you remember Hebrews five twelve um, is where uh, the writer of Hebrews is. Is actually uh, rebuking. Uh, let me back up here to verse eleven. <clears throat> so eleven through uh, fourteen here, um, the the writer is rebuking the the Hebrew Christians, the the Jewish Christians, um, because he's saying, you know, you should. You're dull of hearing. You're you're willfully refusing to to um, to grow and learn as you should. Verse 12, by this time you ought to be teachers. Um, you need someone to teach you the elementary principles again. Um, so my point here is that uh, only by the working of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God does a person truly learn the ways and thoughts of God. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the Holy Spirit brings maturity. The Holy Spirit uh, brings understanding. And uh, as Hebrews 5.11 or 5.14 says, discernment, that we would be trained to discern good and evil. So um, it's only in cooperation with the Holy Spirit that those really great things are going to happen in a person's life. So in order to prepare to teach well, and that's my uh, class break uh, alarm, in order to teach well, we must prepare well. And one of the first things we have to recognize is just 
that this is about God and his revelation. This is, this is uh, about spiritual um, birth and spiritual transformation. Uh, that's, what, that's, that's our goal. And, and uh, we must uh, work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit and just recognize that, that uh, only if the Holy Spirit is involved is anything really uh, supernatural going to happen. All right, so let's take a 10-minute break, and, um, and uh, we'll come back and continue talking about prep, uh, preparation. Okay, and I am going to go to... This screen.
Okay. Still snowing out here. <clears throat> it was not forecast to be this crazy, but it is. Um, so let's see. Where is my... There we go. Okay. All right. So let's pick it up here again. What time is it? Yeah, close enough. All right. So... Uh, preparing well, that's what we're talking about. Preparing well to teach the Bible. Uh, this is all part of the process. And so one of the things that we must do in preparing well is diligent study. 2 Timothy 2.15. You know, this is this is a this is a leadership verse. This is Paul teaching Timothy, uh, this, this book, 2 Timothy, is, is a leadership development book. A leader teaching another leader uh, how to minister well. And so that's the context of this amazing verse on, on which or from which Awana got its name. I don't remember the King James, but uh, uh, that's that's where the name Awana comes from. A workman uh, approved, not ashamed, something like that. But uh, the New American Standard reads this way. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling. The word of truth. All right, uh, just a, a powerful verse. Let me make some observations. First of all, uh, great Bible teaching begins with great Bible study. All right, that's that's the implication of this verse. Diligent here. The word diligent means to do something with intense effort and motivation. I didn't close that. Close quote that. That's just tragic. But um, <clears throat> do something with intense effort and motivation. To work hard, to do one's best, to endeavor. Okay, so this just gives us the the, the attitude with which we are to uh, study and prepare. The word accurately, think about this now. The word accurately here means that there is a right way to handle the Bible. All right, that may seem pretty basic to you, but there are a lot of people out there who would say that uh, we, we can handle the Bible essentially however we want. Or they'll, they'll say that, that uh, they want to, uh, that, that the right way to handle the Bible is to, to, um, <clears throat> to uh, allegorize it, which means you end up with multiple you know just the, the interpretation is is uh, the, the whim of the, the the interpreter and the bible teacher accurately means there is a right way to handle the bible not not necessarily at this point saying what that right way is but this verse teaches that uh, there is a right way to handle the bible and then uh, fourthly Approved to God, okay? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. This means that, that Bible study and Bible teaching is a big deal. This is not just uh, something that we're doing for our own enjoyment or our own self-fulfillment. Uh, we are either approved uh, to God or we're not. And uh, this, just, this just shows us how important that Bible study and Bible teaching is. Okay, let me just briefly walk through a workman process. You should get a, a, a more thorough uh, lesson on this subject uh, in your Bible study hermeneutics courses. Um, but let me just quickly walk through this and just maybe refresh your memory or, or um, uh, perhaps some of you haven't taken Bible study hermeneutics yet. Um, so this will just be um, an introduction, but but just four key ideas. First of all, always try to identify the main core teaching of a passage. 
All right. So um, when I look at the book of Ephesians, for example, I, I, I've studied this enough to know that he is writing to churches about the importance of the church, the, the importance of, of uh, what we are a part of. And so everything else in the passage kind of uh, falls into place. Everything else in the book falls into place uh, when you understand that that's what he's getting at. Uh, so number two, ask, what is the author intending to say? What's he writing about? What's the subject? Okay, so Ephesians, again, the, the subject is, is the, uh, the, uh, the church and the importance of the church. And so uh, what does Paul have to say about that? He's, he's saying that he prays that they will get it, that they will understand uh, the importance of the church and in, the importance of the church in God's unfolding plan for human history. And, and uh, so he's, he's telling us how we should do church and, and uh, how families fit into the church and, and how uh, we need to be watchful and, and, and do, um, doing, uh, you know, being aware of uh, spiritual warfare and, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, number three, clarify the confusing parts in light of this core teaching. Uh, so in other words, uh, if, we, if we can discern the core teaching, then that helps us to be clear about all the related teachings, all the, all the, the confusing parts of a, of a passage or a book. So study the words, especially verbs, commands, and principles, of the larger context, the culture, etc. And, and so this is all about gaining clarity so that we can inter interpret correctly. And then number four, organize the teaching in an outline, summary statements, key ideas, charts, etc. Uh, organize it, you know? Um, um, it's it's uh, it's so helpful when you could take a, a, a big you know blob of text that you know at first reading I did this just this week with or last week with an article that uh, had no outline associated with it it was just like uh, let's see 21 pages of text and and I was reading it and I uh, wasn't uh, Clear on what the author was talking about, so I so I decided to outline it, and I did, and I found five sections uh, 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 in the article uh, that that was building his case. They were they were the, the the core concepts of the of the article, and and I looked for uh, the author's intent. You know, did he say this is what I'm going to try to do in this article? And he did gave two real clear statements about what he wanted to do in the book, in the article. And then um, that also helped me to identify those five core concepts. And, and uh, then the article made sense to me, but until I tried to, to uh, understand its shape and its, and its, and its uh, process and its key ideas, I, I didn't understand what I was reading. And so, we, we, we must do this with books of the Bible as well. We must, we must uh, discern uh, the, the flow of thought. We must identify uh, the, the core statements the, where the author says, this is what I'm writing about. This is why I'm writing it. And, um, you know, sometimes you can even chart things out, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, make a list and whatever. Whatever works for you. Uh, you've got to try to discover uh, the author's the author's uh, structure uh, of what they were writing and, and, and trying to teach. And this just helps us, um, you know, that that transfers, right? So if you if you discern that um, in um, say in a particular chapter of the Bible that uh, the, the the writer is trying to get across four key ideas. Well, then those four key ideas can then become your outline for uh, teaching uh, that passage. And um, you, you may word that however you uh, you know however you think will communicate best to your audience. But if the if the author of scripture is is 
camping on four ideas, he wants to communicate four ideas, then those are the four ideas you want to uh, communicate as well. And, and, and so your teaching outline would then reflect those four key ideas. Make sense? So this is kind of a, just a, a brief introduction to a, a workman process. You know, God gave us a book, and he gave us that book in human language, and, and we must wrestle with it. We must, uh, we must understand the words and, and how the sentences fit together, and we must understand uh, the, the, the context and the culture in which it was written and, and, and really work hard at understanding what it is that we intend to teach. Okay, so if you're going to prepare well, you've got to do serious study, diligent study, as Paul says here in 2 Timothy 2.15. All right, so uh, let me bring up a question. <clears throat> okay, uh, should we read books other than the Bible as part of our diligent study? Why or why not? So it's actually two questions. Did not mean to mislead there, but... It's two questions, uh, which are, I think, pretty critical to the, the, uh, the important issue of preparing well and doing diligent study. Now, I ask this question because I've had people ask me this. I've had people not even really ask me, but tell me, I don't need to read anything else. All I need is my Bible. And I think that that is... Partly true, um, but uh, also uh, it is it is uh, ignoring uh, some of the ways that the Holy Spirit teaches us. In other words, it is ignoring that the, the Holy Spirit teaches us in multiple ways. Uh, obviously, primarily through the Word of God. Um, but uh, he also teaches us through other people. So that's kind of my answer. Uh, of course we should read other books. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Let me go there. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where um, Paul points out in talking about the church gatherings and talking about the the spiritual gifts he says and god has appointed in the church first apostles second prophets third teachers then miracles then gifts of healings helps administrations various kinds of tongues um and, and so my point in reading this passage is that god has appointed uh, these these particular kinds of leaders and teachers and um and, and given uh, various people various gifts. This is all for the purpose of serving you in understanding uh, God's Word, in understanding what it means to be um, uh, built up in your faith. In fact, in another place he says um, that uh, the spiritual gifts are given for the purpose of of uh, the edification of the body, the building up of the body. So this is, you know, God has appointed people and their gifts to minister to you, to build you up. And so, um, uh, one of the ways, and I'm going to skip First Thessalonians five for just a second. Um, one of the ways the Holy Spirit teaches us is through teachers and good books and articles written by trustworthy teachers. After our own Bible study, I would definitely emphasize that. Study the scriptures yourself. Then go see what a brother or sister in Christ has to say about it. Um, so, th so this is an important, wise, and healthy step. This is what we call doing theology in community. Every cult, as I've said before, every cult is started by one guy in his Bible. And he doesn't have any accountability. He doesn't have a community around him. Uh, telling them, wait a second, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Or wait a second, you've forgotten about this. Or wait a second, uh, you're you're uh, you're uh, misinterpreting this verse, and here's why. Okay, so um, God ha God has has uh, 
appointed, he's, he's, he's given teachers, other people who have been walking with the Lord longer than you have. Uh, he's, he's, he's given um, gifts to uh, various teachers in the, in the church and, and leaders. And this is all for, for, you, for the building up of the body. Uh, and and therefore for your building up. So so should you read books other than the Bible? I think absolutely. Uh, there none of them are as important as the Bible, and you can do your own Bible study first. Um, but you should also be very open to what other brothers and sisters in Christ have to say. Let's look at First Thessalonians five twelve through fourteen as well. Now, okay, so. So Paul writes to the Thessalonians, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. What, what's this labor that they do? And have charge over you in the Lord. What's this, what, what's this charge? What does that mean? And give you instruction. So he's talking here about the leaders of the church and uh, that they, you know, assuming that they work hard. If they don't work hard, then maybe you need to be careful, more careful about what they have to say. Uh, they, and they have charge over you in the Lord. The Lord is working in this this system, this this amazing uh, body uh, of Christ, the Church, and uh, it's so that you can get the instruction that you need. So you don't you don't just need to read the Bible. You also need instruction. This is this is all over the New Testament. And he says, and and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And so uh, the body of Christ is supposed to be admonishing. That's warning. It's a form of teaching. Encouragement is a form of teaching. Uh, helping the weak can be uh, many things, but also can include uh, teaching. And uh, in many cases, brothers and sisters. So the, the point is that it's, it's wise. It's, it's a wise and important step to, to do theology in community and, and to hear from uh, and, and other believers and get the perspective of the people who um, have been appointed by the Lord as members of, of the church where you should be plugged in uh, to, to build you up in the faith. All right, so um, reading well, discover the original intent of the author. All right, so this is this is uh, this is just a list of <clears throat> of things that I believe uh, are, are are helpful as we read. Okay, so what I have you doing is one through three. You, you know, you're identifying the title. You're uh, trying to discern the main thesis or what I like I prefer to call the author's intent um, and uh, and then uh, of course the core concepts um, some other things that I think uh, make for really good reading is to identify uh, you know just good charts good diagrams uh, good pictures that that help you uh, process the information being shared uh, good discussion questions Key quotes, uh, growth ideas that you have while you're reading. Document all of these things, and and uh, you will get far more out of your reading. Uh, so so think of two steps. Step one, understand what the author is actually saying. Please, please uh, see the the significance of this. Um, so often people go off, as they say, half cocked, because they think someone is saying one thing, and uh, as it turns out, uh, and and they get angry or they start debating, they start they interrupt and start yelling, um, but in reality they haven't really understood what the author was saying. Um, <clears throat> and then step two is to determine whether the ideas align with or contradict scripture. Okay, we absolutely must test everything we read uh, with scripture, but. Um, you know, um, I I did I did not vote for Barack Obama. I'm not a fan, um, and I, I say that because uh, I want to make a point. Um, I came across, or someone shared a video with me, 
uh, a while back, and it was a, a video clip of Barack Obama saying some somewhat outrageous things, um, and I just uh, it just didn't sit well with me. I don't I don't like him. I think I don't I don't like his uh, his ideas, and that's uh, and I, and I'm saying that because even even though um, I I um, I don't uh, usually agree with him on most things. I had a bad sense about this quote that, that and it was a clip. It was his voice, uh, and it was his image saying these things. But I it just didn't sit well with me. And even though I'm not a fan, um, and even though I rarely agree with him, um, I. Uh, decided that I would not just uh, accept this as as uh, you know uh, truth or, or that 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 Barack Obama actually said these things. It just seemed outrageous to me. And so what I did was I did a little research and I found that uh, the person who had shared this with me, uh, and perhaps they got it from somewhere somewhere else, the video clip regardless of who started it, had taken, had been taken completely out of its context. In other words, he was saying something like this. Some people say such and such and such and such, which is, and, and then he's saying, I, and I don't agree with that. And so someone cut off the ends of that, the part where some people say, and I don't agree with that. Uh, and they just took the clip where he was, basically quoting other people as though he said that, as though he believed that. And so I shared that with the person who shared the clip with me originally because it's so important for us to understand what the author is actually saying. So, you know, uh, I think that there are some places in the book of 1 Corinthians where Paul is actually being sarcastic or, or not necessarily. Um, let, let me give a different example. Um <clears throat> There's a, there's a point in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul says, says uh, let, let, let's eat, drink, and be merry, uh, you know, for, t for tomorrow we die. Well, is that what he really believed we should do? No. He's actually quoting other people who, who say that there is no resurrection. And he's saying if there's no resurrection, if these other people are correct— and there's no resurrection, and we're just worm food food when we die. Then let's just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Um, he doesn't believe that, but he was quoting someone else. So if you if you took Paul's uh, words out of context, you would think he believed that. So it's so critical for us to understand what the author is actually saying. In fact, I, another example, as with uh, uh, President Biden, but when he was uh, Senator Biden, long time ago. Um, he was he was in the Senate, and he was he was reading something that someone else had said, and in that document that he was quoting, and he had a he had a purpose for doing this. He was he was trying to demonstrate the the um, either the racism or the bias of of a certain uh, organization, I think, and. <clears throat> Uh, in this quote that he read, uh, the person used the N-word twice. And then later, of course, uh, you begin to see this clip of, of Senator Biden using the N-word when he was actually quoting someone else who used the N-word and, and, and whoever... Uh, whoever edited that clip, wanted it to look like uh, Joe Biden was, was using the N-word. And, and so, uh, and that got, that got widely circulated. And I, and I had, I shared with several people, look, you know, I don't, I don't ag agree with the man on most things, but let's, let's be clear about what he actually said here and what he actually was doing. Um, <clears throat> so um, these are just, some, some examples that come to my mind about how it's so important to understand what the author is actually saying 
what someone actually said, and, and then we can determine whether the ideas that they're sharing, what they're writing about, and that's the context here. Should we read other books? Should we listen to other sermons, you know, and all that? Uh, absolutely, this is doing theology in community, but we, we need to, first of all, really understand what they're trying to say, which is why when I have you read uh, your textbooks uh, and your your uh, your, your uh, articles, um, what I'm having you do is simply identify this is what the author is actually saying. That's such an important skill, and it's critical to um, to your own study is to first of all understand what the author actually said, and then you can compare that with scripture to make sure that what this person is saying either aligns with scripture or not. But uh, just that process of, of getting the thoughts and the experience and the wisdom of other believers is so helpful. And you're not going to agree with everything uh, that, that uh, you read, of course, but I think it is really important in diligent study, in preparation for teaching the Bible, to read to read widely, to read uh, even the critics of the scriptures so that you can understand what they are, are, are critical of. Hopefully that was worth the rabbit trail there. But um, one other thing as we talk about the teaching process before, what do we do before uh, we actually teach or lead a discussion? Okay, and that is prayerful creativity. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Okay, and Paul is uh, writing this, and he's, he's talking about some other teachers here uh, in, in context. He's, he's, he's um, talking about the way he taught versus the way some others taught. And he says this, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So uh, in context here, um, I believe that Paul is uh, writing. Oh, I, I skipped a chapter here. This chapter is here. Um, sorry. I believe that Paul was, was comparing himself to... The, uh, the speakers of, uh, uh, in Corinth who, who did um, uh, kind of flaunt their superiority of speech and um, they claimed to know everything about everything and they, they came to you, they, they, they spoke with great uh, strength and, and boldness and um, they attempted to be very persuasive with the with their wisdom and um, Paul says I didn't do that I, I didn't do that I I simply brought to you a message I didn't try to manipulate you like these other speakers okay that's what I believe is going on in context um, so so what do the phrases superiority of speech persuasive words of wisdom wisdom of men, suggest about how we should not be manipulative, manipulating people. Um, so what in this passage tells us how we should teach? Well, um, remember that he, he says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified uh, with weakness and in fear. So, so the, the gist of this is that he's, he's emphasizing the message, not the messenger. Uh, it's not... It, Paul would say, it's not about me. It's not about the teacher or the, or the proclaimer. It's about the message. And so, um, and, 
And so first and foremost is that we don't want to make our Bible teaching about us. We want, as I've said before, we want to make sure that our listeners learn. They, they learn what God said. They learn um, what, what the scriptures actually teach. Uh, we, we don't want it to be about us. Okay? Um, so there is a sense in which creativity can can turn all of the attention onto the message. And this, this happens, this has happened a, a lot over the past few hundred years where preachers uh, and just good speakers, uh, not, not just uh, formal you know, preachers uh, who stand in pulpits every Sunday, but, but others, other, other teachers of various kinds have, have, reached such heights of fame and popularity that um, that it, it can and has become toxic and, and very problematic. Okay, so I want to just balance what, I, what I'm going to say here about creativity with that. That, um, you know, creativity and, and uh, persuasiveness and just impressiveness as a communicator can actually get in the way of what we want to accomplish, and that is for people to learn what God has said. Uh, but on the other side, uh, creativity is a good thing, and, and I would really love to know how you would make a biblical case for the use of creativity in our teaching. And let me just share a few of my thoughts since you're not in the room. Uh, let's look at first. Or, or sorry, at Ephesians 1, 15 through 17. Okay, Ephesians 1, 15 through 17. Okay, and this is Paul saying, this is how he prays for the Ephesians. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. All right. <clears throat> um, and then he prays for them again in chapter 3, 14 through 19. Uh, let me read through this. And uh, I think this that was 14. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Okay, so how do you make the case, the biblical case, for the use of creativity in our teaching? First of all, uh, I add the word prayerful. Prayerful creativity. I believe first and foremost we need to be willing to step back and say, say, uh, God, I pray for these people that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach. I pray for these people that I'm going to try to share the scriptures with. And I pray that, that you would just, and, and I often pray this, and that is that if anything that I say is not in agreement with your word, uh, then please let these people forget it as quickly as possible. Um, and in fact, show me, show me where. You know, let this be about you. Let this be about your word. And if my creativity can can enhance that, if my creativity can can be the, the, the instrument that you use to to get the point across to the people I'm going to teach, then please use me. Please use my creativity. Um, but I think also uh, we have to be ready to also say that your will be done and if and if my creativity is going to get in the way and it's going to make this this message or this discussion about me then please uh, keep me from from making that error 
Okay, so I believe Paul was praying that that God, that the Holy Spirit would show these people uh, what they needed to know, which he teaches in the book of Ephesians. And uh, notice that he prayed that that they would receive a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, that, that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints and to know the love of Christ. This is what, these were his goals in teaching. And uh, his creativity, uh, our creativity could, could either uh, enhance that or, or, you know, get in the way and, and distract people from it. Um, it's like um, I was telling somebody about a, a funny uh, billboard uh, along the highway. And uh, it was, um, okay, it, the, the, the slogan was, Pay diddly for your squats. Okay, so it's for a, a gym, uh, a gym membership, you know, uh, workout center. And then the person said, "Okay, uh, it was it was a clever statement. Do you remember the company? Do you remember what gym it was for?" And I couldn't remember. And so it kind of defeated the point, right? If 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 uh, our creativity uh, distracts from, you know, the real point that. We want you to come to such and such place. And if I can't remember such and such place, then, then the creativity um, distracted me from, from knowing the brand, right? So uh, we, can do the, we can do the same thing. We can uh, simply distract people from the real point. I, I remember uh, someone uh, telling me about a, a service that they went to, a, a big mega church in the Dallas area. And um, the pastor of this church actually drove a tank up onto the the stage of this this mega church, and um, just you know the person that was telling me this was just like this was the coolest thing ever, you know. And, and actually, it was a it was a youth, it was a high school student that was telling me this story, and I said, "Wow, that's that's an amazing illustration." Uh, what what was his point? And the kid couldn't remember what, what was the point. All he could remember was this amazing illustration of a tank in church, you know. So, you know, our creativity can either serve to help the Holy Spirit do what Paul was praying for here, or, or it, can, it can distract and it can actually work against what our ultimate goals are. So, um, of course, Jesus was a master teacher, using great creativity in his teaching. Um, let me take you to Matthew 10, 16, just as, a, as one of many examples. Um, <clears throat> Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So, be shrewd as serpents, and innocent as, as doves. Um, I think I preached a sermon once called Sheep and Wolves and Serpents and Doves, you know, because he uses actually four different animals there and, and says, uh, you know, uh, gives us this great picture of, of what we are to be. We're to be sheep. We are sheep as sheep. And we're to be shrewd, and we're to be innocent. And um, so, shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. I mean, that, that's just a, 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 a one of many, many illustrations of how Jesus was a master teacher, and he did use creativity in his teaching. Uh, there's this great passage, of course, in John 15, where Jesus says, "I am the vine; you are the branches." And he talks about us bearing fruit, and and um, at least. Um, one historian that I that I read said that he believed that Jesus was walking with his disciples uh, to the uh, to the uh, Garden of uh, Gethsemane, and on the way from the upper room to the garden, uh, there was a vineyard right outside the city. There was a vineyard, and and so he speculated that Jesus was walking through this vineyard, and he turned to his disciples and he said. I'm the vine, and you're the branches. So, you know, just Jesus was just a master teacher. 
and he did use creativity. He did use creative uh, illustrations and stories and all kinds of things. And Paul used reason and persuasion in his, in his teaching. He didn't just state the facts and, and, and just, uh, you know, um, even in that passage where he says, I, I, you know, decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. He's, he's, um, even in that, that's, that's a creative way of saying the, the most important thing that I wanted you to know was Jesus and that he died for our sins and rose from the dead. Um, and, and, but he wasn't saying that he didn't know anything else. He wasn't saying that I refuse to talk about anything else. Uh, that's, we know that that's not the case. He wrote 13 letters of the New Testament. He did talk about things other than Christ and him crucified. He, he said that to make his point. It was actually a creative way of saying the most important thing that I had to say to you was uh, about the cross. And so he, he did use uh, reason and persuasion in his teaching. Uh, look at Acts 19.8. He said, uh, we're told here that he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So, all right, you tracking with me here? Jesus was a, a very creative master teacher. Paul was a master teacher. We could look at the, the teaching of Peter and, and others as well. My point is that we do have the freedom to be creative and persuasive in our teaching. That's something that we, we definitely have the freedom to do. We have a lot of freedom to do. But we must also remember that ultimately the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms hearts and minds. So we should use prayerful creativity. You know, another thing that I would say just in, in making the biblical case for creativity is that that God Himself is is the 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 ultimate creator. He is he is extremely creative. And if you just do a little biology, you you see that He created this world with just uh, a, an infinite amount of creativity. And and we're we're made in His image. And I believe that uh, part of that image is the ability to, to work with him in, in creation, in, in creating, in filling the earth. Um, you know, uh, just the fact that um, we, uh, the very first command in the Bible, the very first command is go have a bunch of babies, be fruitful, and multiply. He's, he's inviting us. He wants us to participate in his creative work. Now, we can't pick up a handful of dirt and make a person, um, but by, by the way that he has created us and designed us as male and female, uh, he has made us to participate in uh, his creative work by having babies, be fruitful and multiply. Um, and, um, and, I, and I believe that that extends to many areas of life, uh, including teaching the Bible. I believe he wants us to be Creative and 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 to and to do our best to um, to help people understand and and to help them overcome the confusion and the barriers and the and whatever um, by by uh, creatively teaching and by persuasively teaching. Uh, but we need to do that prayerfully, as we uh, also recognize that we can become a, a, a distraction from the core primary message of Christ and him crucified. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> right? So the, the first part of the teaching process is, is to prepare, right? Uh, prepare, um, uh, uh, diligently through study, prayer, uh, prayerfully, uh, Prayerful creativity, and, um, and and in other words, to prepare well, to prepare um, uh, 
first and foremost by recognizing that the that, that this is about God, it's about His message, it's about the Holy Spirit, and then to um, diligently study and then to you know prayerfully uh, include creativity and persuasion. Okay, but let's now talk about um, presenting appropriately. Okay, and I'm not going to get very far into this before we take another break, but that is okay. Okay, uh, what are some of the forms teaching can take? Well, I'd like you to take about 10 seconds here while I get a sip of my water and just think about that. What are some of the forms that teaching can take? Remember some of the ways Jesus taught, and I'm going to look up a couple of these verses. But, but um, first of all, of course, there's discourse. You look at Matthew five through seven, the Sermon on the Mount. It's it's just Jesus talking, okay? And I don't even know how long it takes to read the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's like, I think it's like 15 minutes or something like that. But that's a discourse, and and really, I'm teaching Matthew right now, so really the the whole whole structure of Matthew is five discourses that kind of mirrors uh, the five books of Moses or something like that. And, um, you know, Ma Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount is one of the longest discourses, but, but there are five discourses that really uh, outline the, the, the Gospel of Matthew. So discourse was definitely something that, that Jesus utilized. Uh, imagine what that would be like to to sit at the feet of Jesus and just listen to him talk. Uh, stories also. Matthew 13 is full of, of parables. I believe I counted eight parables in Matthew 13. The, the first one is the, you know, the soils, and there's, there's a, a sower throwing seed, and some of it goes on the path, and, and it doesn't get through the hard, packed dirt. Then there's you know, the seed thrown into the... Um, the uh, uh, the rocky place, I believe, is in the next one, and and uh, it, it sprouts up, and and then the, the the hot sun, you know, prevents it from bearing fruit, and then there's then there's the uh, the thorny place, and the and the thorns and the weeds come up and choke out the uh, the plant from from bearing fruit, and then there's the the seed that's thrown on the onto good soil. And uh, it bears much fruit. So, so Jesus told these kinds of stories, parables, and stories, and he and he told the story of of the rich man and the poor man, uh, and they both died on the same night. And and the and the poor man goes and he and he's uh, what Jesus said is is in Abraham's bosom. In other words, he's he's in the uh, the uh, the same place as Abraham. And and then the rich man. Uh, is in a place of torment. You know, is this a is this a parable? I don't think so. Jesus didn't say it was a parable. I think Jesus just knew about the, this, you know, these two actual people, and so he, but he he tells he couches his lesson about how we need to be rich toward God uh, in this incredible story about these two people. Um, and and many, we could think of many many stories. The the the. Uh, story of the prodigal son is considered the greatest short story ever by some people. Um, repetition. Jesus used repetition. Look at Matthew 8, 31. Matthew 8, 31. I hope you're turning to these passages with me now and not just letting me do all the work, but um, Jesus said that the demons, or not Jesus, uh, this was uh, Matthew saying the demons began to entreat him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And this is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for Mark 8.31. I read that. I started reading this with such confidence, but, but I was in the totally wrong place. Isn't that cool? That's a teaching, that's a teaching uh, skill. And, uh, and as well as, you know, just admitting that you were in the wrong place and, and you Laugh, laugh at yourself and and uh, go find the right place. But anyway, Mark eight thirty one, and he began to teach them. 
that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And this translation says that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. So he didn't just teach them this once. In fact, I, I know people have counted uh, uh, how many times Jesus actually said that he was going to suffer and die and rise again on the third day. But I think that this verse implies that he taught them repeatedly. He began to teach them uh, these things. So this this was something that was a, kind of an ongoing conversation. All right, let me just finish this real quick, and then we'll take another break. So, um, sorry, let me back up. So he used questions, Matthew 9, 5. Uh, this is actually in Matthew. Uh, uh, I love this story where... Uh, He's talking to the paralytic, and he, and he just asks the, uh, the uh, let me back up here. Um, he, he asks the uh, scribes, um, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. What a great question. What a great question. Uh, it's, it, it, it totally throws them off, and that... And it's kind of fun, actually, to, to watch someone win a debate. And that, but that's not even the, the most beautiful thing here, is that he, he just simply, uh, in, 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 a, in a very um, uh, a very decisive way, I guess, a, a very creative way, uh, by asking this question, demonstrates uh, his, his own wisdom and greatness. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Um, and, and literally, I believe that they, they didn't know what to say. Um, we, we would probably want to use questions differently. We'd want pe to engage people in conversation. But uh, just, just one example of how Jesus used questions to teach, and boy, did he get his point across. Uh, dialogue. So Matthew 16 is this great passage where Jesus is having a dialogue with his his uh, uh, disciples, and he starts with a question, who do people say that I am? And then there's there's discussion about it. And then he said, he asks a second question, well, who do you say that I am? This beautiful combination of questions there. And then uh, the discussion goes to, uh, uh, you know, he, he loves Peter's answer, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, and then he, he celebrates that and tells him that that's a, a something that the father revealed to him and and then um, he he uh, he um, uh, talks about how uh, he's going to have to die and, and rise from the dead and and uh, this sparks a whole big conversation about discipleship so he's using dialogue there question and answer and and uh, they're you know he's he's responding to their just shock that he's saying that he's going to die and so it's just a it's just a wonderful illustration of how Jesus used dialogue at times as well and just this is time and his example he he spent uh, three years at least with these disciples and really he came to die and rise from the dead he could have done that in a week he could have done that in less than a week but uh, he chose to teach to to spend time with these disciples and and serve as, a, as the best example ever to them uh, over a period of three years. And so th these are just all, these are, this is just a short list of things that came to my mind about, about how uh, Jesus taught. And so, you know, maybe a, a natural question would be, which, which ones are best? And why would you say that? And I wish we could uh, have a dialogue in, cl in the classroom about it, um, but we can't because of all that snow coming down. And then, um, so uh, instead of saying which ones are best, start with this. Think, present appropriately. Present appropriately. So again, we're talking about during here, the teaching, uh, the actual act of teaching. Uh, discourse is appropriate for large crowds. Uh, it's not my favorite way to teach, but it is appropriate for large crowds. Uh, hard to have a discussion uh, and you know when you have a large group 
when you try to do discussion, um, your your most uh, extroverted are going to dominate that situation. <clears throat> uh, and so there are just times when discourse is, is appropriate, and, and Jesus demonstrated this. Uh, stories and object lessons are appropriate for children. I think the more we can, you know, bring things, uh, you know, to life and, and visualize things for, for children, uh, the better. And, and so, you know, these object lessons that Jesus used or, or the stories that Jesus used <clears throat> sort of as good examples of how we might uh, do the same thing with, uh, with particular audiences. <clears throat> I think American audiences are more and more, um, you know, it, it's it's more appropriate for American audiences uh, to to use stories and, and object lessons just because of the juvenileization of American Christianity. That's a whole other conversation. Uh, but repetition is appropriate almost all the time to review and repeat. Questions and dialogue are appropriate for smaller groups. Um, time and example are appropriate for longer term relationships. However, there's something I want to add to this conversation um, of presenting appropriately, but we're going to do that after we take a short break. Okay, I'm just going to I'm going to make this a five minute break instead of ten, and I'm going to give you uh, a chance to um,
Okay, let's go to the however. So we're talking about the teaching process, presenting appropriately. So this is during the actual teaching event. Lots of different uh, tools at our disposal. And I think we need to think appropriately, what's appropriate to the situation. However, I want to make a case for um, uh, I guess thinking outside the box a little bit on this issue. So um, let me share with you an ancient Chinese proverb to illustrate my point. Um, <clears throat> the proverb goes like this, I hear and I forget. And this is true. We remember up to 10% of what we hear. And that I think that's on a good day. I think that's a that's, a, that's on the high end of that statistic. Um, I see and I remember, and uh, it is true that we remember up to 50% of what we hear and see. And then I do and I understand. And statistically, this is from the seven laws of the teacher. Um, we, statistically, we remember as much as 90% of what we hear, see, and do. Okay, and this, this lines up with Bloom's taxonomy. The more we do, the more, you know, if we can get up to the, to the point of creating, then we will never perhaps uh, totally forget uh, the, the things that we do that are up at the, the, the top of the, of the taxonomy. So, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And so this, this proverb uh, makes this point. Some methods are better than others, okay? Um, yes, we have all these different examples of how Jesus taught. Yes, we have lots of different uh, methods to choose from when we teach the Bible. But my contention is that some methods are better than others. Okay, so I'm just curious, what do you remember about the last sermon you heard? Um, and I think I asked this question last week or maybe the week before, um, but I think, I think we would agree that, that most people can't really pull out a lot. They just can't. Um, you know, some people have better memories than others and whatever, but, but, but most people um, can't really give you much information about the last sermon they heard or or you know the farther you go back in in time the less you're going to get you, you, you know maybe not you can't even remember what topic or what series your pastor was in a year ago or whatever um but what about the last lesson you taught or the last paper you wrote Okay, something you personally did, something you personally created, you just, you're going to remember more of that than, than you will of just something that you just heard. So just an illustration of this point. Um, so what I want to do here is I want to do a quick review of, of uh, basic ideas behind uh, how, how does the Holy Spirit help uh, teach us. I just want to highlight a couple of things there and, and remind you of of what we already talked about there. And then I want to make the case for dialogue or what is often called Socratic discussion. And then I want to talk a little bit about the skill of leading a discussion. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that um, discussion is on a par with saying I do and I understand. So I do. What what are you doing? Well, you're you're trying to communicate your ideas. That's what you're doing. You're trying to trying to understand someone else's ideas, and you're trying to communicate your own thoughts and ideas when uh, you're in a dialogue, when you're in a discussion. But if you're sitting passively and listening to someone else, uh, regardless of how creative and persuasive and talented they are at at speaking, I'm convinced that. Dialogue is a, is a better way to teach because 
that gets people actively engaged in doing in doing not necessarily doing the teaching but doing the process of theology uh, that's what we we do when we're in a theological discussion or in, in a in a spiritual discussion or a bible study we we are dialoguing and therefore we are doing the work of of theology and community okay so let's start with a review of how the holy spirit teaches us this is actually a shorter list than i shared before but this is just to remind you of how the holy spirit is working through uh, lots of different ways so romans 12 1 and 2 he's um, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds i believe that that is the spirit of god working through the the scriptures and so of course that can take the form of dialogue uh, it can also take the form of discourse or, or lecture or sermon uh, number two we looked at first uh, thessalonians 5 12 through 14 that the holy spirit works through teachers uh, those who give you instruction um, we know you know that this this is the case and this is this also can take different forms uh, but the holy spirit is working through that and then um we talked about Acts 15 and Colossians 3 and, and, and how uh, we are to let the word of Christ richly dwell within us. That's, that's uh, the church community, uh, the body of Christ. And that's, that's, I believe that that is by discussion and community. We'll actually look at this passage later. Um, but discussion in community is, is uh, I think, was very prevalent in the, in the early church. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 2, um, by prayer and reflection, maybe that's the, combination of spiritual thoughts with spiritual words and that whole passage which which is just great so my point is simply that the holy spirit teaches us in lots of different ways um, and and not just through sermon or discourse um, one of those ways is is this very interactive sorry i didn't uh, stop that that's not the end of class just so you know um, but but just uh, through through uh, all these very interactive uh, community sort of focused uh, things, uh, primarily through the Word of God and just the and the the Word of Christ richly dwelling within the community. All right, so so now let me make the case for dialogue. Okay, Socratic discussion. Um, I want to make the case for it because I want to encourage this form of teaching. Just because I think it's it's on the the that end of the spectrum where you're doing and therefore you're understanding better. So I want to talk first about the word dialogue in Scripture. I want to talk about participatory gatherings, and I want to talk about the one another's. And, and this is my case for the use of dialogue and that that it is a um, a superior form of of communication. Okay, of teaching. So let's first of all look at the word dialogue. Okay, look at Acts 20, verses 7 through 11. All right, Acts 20. And you're turning here too, right? Am I right? Acts 20, starting in verse 7. So this is uh, uh, Paul uh, in, um, in uh, Troas. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took the boy away. They took away the boy alive and were very comforted. All right, so uh, this was in some ways, I think, a, a normal gathering, first day of the week. Um, it was in the evening over dinner. I think that that was normal. But there are obviously uh, also some abnormal things about this. Uh, Paul was there, for one thing, and because he was the, the guest teacher, uh, 
this at this church. Um, they let him talk as long as he wanted, and he prolonged his message until midnight. And then we see later that um, uh, he, in verse eleven, he talked with them a long while until daybreak. So we're not at all suggesting that this should this is an indication of exactly how they did church, or else we would we would do church uh, all night long, uh, literally until sunrise. Um, but I mean, just think about it. If you had Paul as a guest in your church, wouldn't you uh, do your best? Uh, unlike Eutychus, uh, you do your best to stay awake and, and just listen to him as long as he wanted to talk, as long as he was willing to, to stay and talk. And I mean, uh, we, we would all want, want that, I think. But notice <clears throat> some words here. Verse 7, Paul began talking to them. Um, that Greek word for talking is actually uh, dialogue. It's it's the, the transliteration uh, dialogue, um, and um, let's see what else here. Uh, Paul kept on talking. Verse nine, same word dialogue. And um, then you skip to verse 11, um, where they went back up with the living Eutychus. And uh, we're told that he talked um, with them a long while until daybreak. And that's the word we get homiletics from. Homileo is the Greek word. Okay, and so these, these words are all part of uh, describing what was happening here in this gathering. And again, I'm not saying that necessarily this is exactly how they did church everywhere, but it does line up with lots of other things. And so in this case, I'm, I'm going to say that talking to them, which is uh, dialogetto, verses 7 and 9, and then talked with them, verse 11, homilus. Hum uh, it's it's the word we get homiletics from, because uh, actually I, I was questioning whether that was exactly right, but the word used here is uh, homileo, which is a verb, aorist active, participle singular. Uh, but anyway, um, those two Greek words can be used to carry the idea of conversation or dialogue. Um, so. In other words, this is evidence that the teaching was interactive. It was a dialogue. It was a conversation. Um, not necessarily it could be that Paul did most of the talking. I would guess that Paul did most of the talking in this case. Um, if, um, if I was in a church gathering with the Apostle Paul and uh, other people were uh, talking too much, I would say, could you please be quiet and let me just listen to the Apostle Paul? But... Based on these words, it, it is at least possible that um, that there was a conversation and dialogue going on here, and, and and I think that Paul probably liked to ask questions and and to make sure that his audience was understanding him. Okay, but let me share a couple of other things with you. Okay, so um, uh, just some other passages. Okay, uh, just to just to highlight that these words, I think, most of the time, are referring to dialogue. So Luke 24, 14 through 15, this is um, uh, the, uh, the two travelers on the road to Emmaus. And, and uh, it says they were talking with each other. Um, and the word there is homiloon, same root word as the word back in uh, Acts 20. Uh, and they were talking with, him, uh, with each other about all these things which had taken place. Now, would it be, would it be, wouldn't it be really weird for if, if what they're saying here is, and they were <coughs> sermonizing with each other, or they were lecturing each other about all these things. That doesn't make any sense, does it? And clearly, this was a dialogue. It was a conversation uh, going on. He says, uh, uh, Luke says, while they were uh, talking and discussing, uh, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Okay, so again, just. The idea of a lecture or sermon doesn't, doesn't fit here. 
uh, the most natural explanation is discussion. Acts 24, 26. Uh, at the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Uh, therefore, he also used to sin for him quite often and converse with him. Homiline, same root word as found in Acts 20. So, again, this is a conversation. That's the most natural uh, interpretation, or sorry, translation, not uh, sermonizing or lecturing. Mark 9.34 but they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed, uh, this is the same root word as, as uh, in, in uh, Acts 20, um, uh, the, the transliteration of dialogue. Uh, it's the same root word. Um, on the way they had uh, discussed dialogue with one another, which, which of them was the greatest. Again, uh, maybe, maybe there was some pontification going on here, but... But sermonizing doesn't make sense. They were having a discussion, perhaps even an argument, about who was the greatest. All right, so that's just three examples of how these words are used uh, uh, more naturally as discussion rather than lecture or sermonizing. So uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary says dial dialegomai uh, primarily, and this is the root word for uh, that, that's used in Acts 20, primarily denotes to ponder, resolve in one's mind. Dia means through. Lego means to say. Uh, then, uh, quote, to converse, dispute, discuss, discourse with. Okay? Uh, it primarily denotes uh, these, these things. To converse, to dispute, discuss, discourse with. Uh, most frequently, to reason or dispute with. In Hebrews 12.5, the, the revised version, um, not the revised version, I can't remember what RV stands for, but it's a version of the scriptures, uh, reasoneth with uh, is to be preferred to the KJV, speaketh unto. So here's Vine saying it's preferable to say that the translation here was that he, he reasoned with conversed with, he dialogued with, uh, that's to be preferred over speaketh unto, to speak to, as in a lecture. The KJV translates it preached in Acts 27 and 9. Uh, this, the RV corrects to discoursed, literally dialogued, i.e. not by way of a sermon, but by a discourse of a more conversational character. So Vine's Expository Dictionary, for what it's worth, uh, totally agrees with me that the, that the more natural way to translate Acts 27 and 20, 29 uh, is dialogued, not preached to. And Strong's agrees. Uh, 1256, which is dialegomai, um, middle voice, uh, detail, detail, detail. Um, A.B. translates as dispute six times, reason with twice, reason twice, preach unto once, preach once, and speak once. Number one definition, to think different things with one's self, mingle thought with thought. 1A definition, to ponder, resolve, revolve in mind. And then number two, here's what I want you to see, to converse, discourse with one argue, discuss, okay? Uh, so this is how Strong's understands uh, this term as well. In classical and Hellenistic Greek, dialegomai is mostly used for converse or discussion. Um, in Socrates, you see there in the middle of that paragraph, in Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, there is developed the art of persuasion and demonstration in the form of question and answer as in Socrates, that's where we get the term Socratic discussion, because Socrates was known for question and answer dialogue. Note, despite their statement above, the authors of the, the uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament later claim that all uses of dialegomai in Acts refer to, quote, religious lectures or sermons. Unbelievably, they, they 
I think, contradict themselves. Uh, this is inconsistent and in agreement with Vines and Strong's belief it is more likely that most of these references refer to dialogue. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the TDNT, is actually, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, paraphrasing, there's a lot of interpretation going on in these words. And, and so despite what they said in this one spot about um, the form of question and answer and that's how this this what that's what this word means. They later try to make it um, lectures or sermons, which is a really strange um, inconsistency. But look at look at, at some more examples from Scripture, uh, Acts seventeen two. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them. The dialectica is the same root word. Uh, as this this word dialogue uh, from the scriptures. Uh, does it make sense that he, um, for three Sabbaths, uh, preached to them? Possibly. That would possibly work there. Uh, it seems more natural, though, that he, uh, he, he dialogued with them. Acts 17, 17. So he was reasoning, again, same root word, in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. Um, could it be that these were sermons? Uh, it seems more natural that he was, he was, uh, you know, the, the translation reasoning um, with the Jews uh, makes more sense. Acts eighteen four, and he was reasoning. Uh, same root word in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Um, Acts 18, 19, they came to Ephesus and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Um, again, could be sermonizing and lectures, but more likely it was dialogue. Acts 24, 12, neither in the temple nor in the synagogues nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot? Uh, Acts 19.9, But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples' reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So my point is that all of these passages, um, even though it's possible that some of them refer to lectures or, ser or sermons, they all allow for and I think more naturally argue for uh, discussion or dialogue. Okay, so dialogue, I believe, was prevalent in the New Testament. It was probably the preferred teaching method. Okay, so that's just from a study of the word dialogue, just making the case for dialogue from the words uh, themselves. Look at 1 Corinthians 14 now. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Let me check the time here. Yes, I need to hurry. Um, <clears throat> and actually, since there's two parts to this, I, I can finish up whatever I don't get to uh, next week. But he says, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone, hold on, 26 to 33. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and, and each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets of prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So um, just a, a broad outline here. What, what, what's happening in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14? What's happening in this passage that I just read, uh, 14, 26 through 33? Well, it's, it's all about the gatherings of the church. This is the longest passage in the New Testament that addresses the 
the gatherings of the church. So um, Paul praises them for holding to the traditions just as he delivered them at the beginning of chapter 11. And then he covers the issue of head coverings and um, the headship of husbands uh, and how that relates. That's, that's all about the church gatherings, that the, that the women were not wearing head coverings in the church gatherings as a, as a sign of, of, of their, their freedom from headship. And, and, and Paul um, addresses that. I think it's a cultural issue. Um, but that's what that's what's happening in the in that section. Then he talks about the Lord's Supper in the rest of chapter eleven, and then twelve through fourteen, the issue is spiritual gifts. But this is all related to the gatherings of the church. And in twelve one through eleven, uh, he talks about the source of the gifts, which is the Holy Spirit. Twelve through thirty one, he talks about the diversity of the gifts in unity. That the that the church is one body, but um, you know some. Not everyone's an eye, not everyone's an ear, you know, and and that's a good thing. Then 31 through chapter 13, uh, the motivation for exercising spiritual gifts should be love. And then chapter 14, excuse me, is about the purpose of gifts, and that is the edification of the church, the priority of prophecy over over, which is teaching, the priority of prophecy over tongues, and just the... The, uh, the need for uh, what he calls, um, if you look at uh, verse 40, uh, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Okay, So this is what's happening in the gatherings of the church. Uh, this, this, is, this is Paul addressing the problems in the Corinthian gatherings. Okay, uh, But here in this passage that we just read, okay, it's... Um, you know, each one has a psalm, has a tongue, whatever. <clears throat> and so um, this means, when he says each one, this means that all believers in the gathering were encouraged to participate. Okay? Um, I remember hearing, um, what's his name, Francis Chan, talk about how he decided to, to um, leave his megachurch when he, he looked out one morning and he, and he saw 5,000 people sitting and doing nothing. And then there was this one guy himself up there uh, using his gifts, but nobody else was doing anything. Well, each one here makes it clear that, that all believers in the gatherings of the early church were encouraged to participate. What does that look like today? Uh, he, he talks about edification. This is uh, the word that's used in the ESV and the CSB. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry. They translate it building up. They don't translate it edification, but building up. And this was the purpose of the gatherings of the church. And again, each one had been given gifts for this common good of building up the church. Um, and, and yet um, most people don't really use their gifts uh, in churches today, at least not in the gatherings of the church as Paul is talking about here. Um, but each one had been given gifts for that purpose, has been given gifts for that purpose. So he also says, uh, prophets speak, verse 29, um, that uh, if you recall, um, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. And he, uh, uh, he, he means that there, th this tells us that there was a, a more um, intentional teaching time too. Um, you know, it's, it's two or three, uh, not just one, which I think is a fascinating idea. Um, but when he's talking about prophets there, he's talking about people speaking in the language of the church. Um, whether they're receiving new revelation or not, they're speaking in the, in the, the language of the church, building up the body of Christ uh, in a language that they can understand. And then in verse 33, he says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, uh, as in all the churches of the saints. And this tells us that Paul expected these principles to be normative, to be used in all the churches. Okay, so uh, that's a quick uh, look at this important passage. Um, <clears throat> but look at what David Lowry says about this. David Lowry was one of my teachers at Dallas Seminary, uh, wrote part of um, <clears throat> Bible Knowledge Commentary. 
He says that when the church met, anyone was free to participate by contributing a hymn or a word of instruction. Uh, and he, he uh, refers to 1 Corinthians 14, 6 there. <clears throat> 14, 6 was probably a lesson based on the Old Testament. But uh, he says a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation from one gifted in prophecy, or a word from one gifted in a tongue followed by an interpretation of what was said. Okay, so there's a variety of things happening in these gatherings. And he says the controlling principle in this free participation was the rule of love. All that was said and done was to have as its goal the need of strengthening others. Okay, but he affirms that um, anyone was free to participate and the goal was strengthening or building up the body. Look at what Tom Constable says. He also is a uh, professor at Dallas Seminary. He said there was obviously a flexibility about the order of service in the early church, which is now totally lacking. Everything was informal enough to allow any man who felt that he had a message to give, to give it. Okay? So participatory gatherings strongly supports the priority of dialogue. Um, certainly there would be times when the church would sit back and let a prophet speak. But then, did you notice <coughs> that uh, he says in verse 32, and the spirit of prophets are subject to prophets, which means that the other prophets would then um, dialogue about what one of the prophets said. And so uh, I think that there, <clears throat> this, this indicates that there was dialogue between these prophets and, and uh, you know, if the whole church was invited to participate in that uh, discussion, then they could. But if they were confronting a prophet, basically saying you've got this all wrong, then that was the job of the prophets. But, but, but I think the, the larger point here is that there, there was just this, this participation going on. There was, there was a lot of participation in these gatherings, and that I think that argues for the the priority of dialogue in these gatherings rather than just lecture. All right, and then um, <clears throat> one other thing here is the one another's, and I love this, and I am quickly running out of time, so let me move forward here. But let's look at again at Colossians three. I told you we would go back there, and, and we're going to do that now. So Colossians three fifteen and sixteen. <clears throat> He said, let the, uh, Paul wrote, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. All right. So, let me break down this passage a little bit. So he says, word of Christ richly dwell within you, that you there is plural, which indicates that he was you know, writing to all of them. He says, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Okay, so he do um, this doesn't promote a particular form, such as a small group discussion or lecture or, or whatever. Um, but which form will bring about this richness? Uh, dialogue or uh, lecture? Which promotes, uh, along with teaching and admonishing, serious and deep study of the scriptures together? Uh, and remember that he, he says teaching and admonishing one another. All right? So um, he says... Uh, songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. This this shows a variety of, of songs, of, and the teaching and admonishing was to also be done through songs, not just through uh, teachers or lecture or discussion or dialogue, but through the songs that, 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 that they sang together. Music is a powerful form of teaching, and we should strive for theological and doctrinal cor correctness in our songs. <clears throat> But notice that he, he's saying, you know, that that um, through songs, hymn, songs, uh, uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, 
um, they were to teach and admonish one another. Um, and that, that means that um, a particular teacher, it uh, sounds like, could, could pick a song and, um, I don't know why I put songs, <clears throat> um, but it's psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And um, he says that they're to teach and admonish one another with these psalms and the spiritual songs. So it seems to indicate that uh, that a particular person, you know, perhaps even each individual person could pick a song uh, for the purpose of uh, teaching and admonishing the church. And of course, he says one another. I almost got ahead of myself earlier, but but he, he says one another. First, it shows us that this is directed to the church, not just individuals, right? Um, teaching and admonishing one another. Uh, it is in the context of one body, which is verse 15, and through one another ministry, verse 16, and other passages, other verses in this chapter, that the richness will come. And then second, it supports the idea of every member participation in worship, <clears throat> um, which we have looked at in other passages. Okay, so the one another aspect here uh, is is often lost when we just utilize lecture or, or uh, sermons. Uh, I created this chart a while back, I guess uh, 2013, a long time ago. Um, and it's simply a chart of the one another's. And this, this is every reference to one another or each other in the, the New Testament. And so you can just kind of look through this list here, um, be at peace with one another. Lots and lots of love one another. Uh, lots of love one another's. Uh, bear with one another's burdens, Galatians 6 2. Um, let's see. Um, Romans 15 14, admonish one another. Uh, 14 19, build up one another. I'm not going in order here. Uh, Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Uh, on and on it goes. Uh, skip down to the middle and later letters of Paul. Um, we just looked at Colossians 3, 16, but uh, say uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, encourage one another and build up one another. Um, uh, 5, 15 there, seek after that which is good for one another. Hebrews 3.3, 3, encourage one another. Um, just on and on it goes. Okay, lots and lots of one another. So look at all the love one another's in the, in the letters of John. Um, let's see. Um, so anyway, we, we, we could look at this whole list and just see. Um, but here's my point. The nature of churches characterized by these one another's you know, praying for one another, building up one another, bearing with one another, teaching and admonishing one another. Um, it just requires closeness and interaction and dialogue. The nature of churches characterized by these one another's, these one another's, these one another commands requires closeness and interaction and dialogue. This is not a group of people who come and sit passively next to each other for a long period of time and then go home. You cannot accomplish these one another's unless you are close, unless you are interacting with one another, unless you are dialoguing and discussing uh, the matters of faith and, and ministry and life together. And so that's my case for uh, dialogue. And I've got 10 minutes left here, but so let me just do a quick review here. We looked at, oh, I meant to replace that slide. It's not exactly the one I showed you, but it's close. Um, uh, you know, the point of this slide, though, was right there in the middle. Some methods are better than others. And then what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the three circles in, in the bottom right-hand corner. We reviewed how the Holy Spirit teaches us. I just made my case for dialogue or Socratic discussion. And now I want to talk about the skill of leading a discussion. Okay, I want to finish up with this. Do I want to do this? Um, 
I think, I think, I think I'm going to save this for next week because I don't want to have to blaze through this. Um, but what I think I'll do is go ahead and, and, and get into it a little ways here and <clears throat> still finish here in about nine minutes, um, but just get as far as I can in this. Um, uh, but I'm not going to try to blaze through and finish the whole thing. Okay, so first of all, I want to share a quote with you from um, Jeff Reed, uh, an author that, I, that has had a big impact on me. And uh, he, he is one of the few um, writers, pastors, that I'm aware of that has developed a tool to teach people how to do Socratic discussion or dialogue. And uh, this is how he defines Socratic discussion. He calls it a sustained discussion around a set of ideas which gives birth to new insights around and implications of those ideas and helps participants develop greater skill in thinking clearly and translating those ideas into a wisdom base for future development. Okay, that's a, that's a mouthful. But... Um, he's he's uh, starts with a set of ideas, so it's a discussion. Well, actually, he starts with sustained. Sustained means that it's it's uh, it's not short. It's not brief. It's something that's going to happen um, over a, a period of time, and it's gonna it's gonna be around a set of ideas. So maybe um, maybe we would uh, discuss with people. Uh, a set of ideas, say, um, uh, the family, you know, and uh, so we're going to look at uh, several passages related to the family, and we're going to uh, just have a discussion about uh, the implications of these verses that we're reading, and we're going to dialogue, you know, some of us are going to talk about our experience growing up, and, and um, and others are going to talk about uh, people that they know who have such a great family life. And, and, and then we're going to talk about, you know, uh, maybe even get into the cultural issues that Paul was, ri was writing to. And, and all these different uh, sets of ideas around um, uh, the issue of family. And, and so this, uh, you know, ideally, if it's a, if it's a well-done, sustained discussion of these ideas, it's going to give birth to new insights. Uh, and we're going to understand the implications of these ideas better because we've had this sustained discussion. And this is going to help the participants develop greater skill in thinking clearly about what the Bible teaches about family and translating those ideas into a wisdom base. In other words, we're going to be able to live out um, how to live in a family, how to build strong families um, with wisdom. We're going to have a wisdom base for developing uh, our own families and helping other people develop their families. Make sense? So that, that's, the, that, that's the idea of a Socratic discussion. And he goes on and says, the idea of Socratic discussion is not leading discussion to a predetermined point of conclusion, but rather sustaining the discussion around a set of ideas long enough to clearly grasp them and their implications and to begin exploring their application and use in a variety of situations. We have divided the process into four movements. The movements cover the process from study to the conclusion. So he's, you know, he's saying that we don't, lead uh, a discussion for the purpose of, of getting everybody to agree with the leader. But what we want to do is, is uh, we want to lead a discussion that, uh, well, hopefully the leader um, uh, is right about the subject and understands it fully, not always, but, but um, the point is not to get everybody to agree with you, but to get uh, everybody to understand the scriptures and, and, and their implications, the implications of the subject you're discussing, and then to to come to some conclusions about about how to um, live it out and 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 uh, um, help others to live it out. 
Okay, so he, he talks about these four movements. The first movement is, is preparing for the discussion. I'm going to carefully study the biblical passages. Everybody's going to do this. And then carefully read related resources. Um, these are probably going to be chosen by the leader of the discussion. Um, but perhaps uh, someone is, is reading the passages and, and they think, man, I remember reading the book about this passage and it was really good. And so, so but everybody's going to be studying the biblical passages, carefully reading uh, re related resources, thinking through the issues, developing critical understanding of the significance of the issues being studied, and develop a teaching outline and plan. So really the, the movement that he's talking about here is specifically aimed at the leader of the discussion who is going to carefully study, read uh, related resources, um, think things through, um, develop his or her own understanding of the significance of the issues that they're going to study together, and then a teaching outline and plan is developed in preparation for the discussion. Movement two is the early stages of the actual discussion itself. So first of all, we, we've got to understand the biblical passages insist that biblical passages be interpreted accurately and then uh, graciously deal with misinterpretations through probing questions. Okay, so rather than saying, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, you're, you're misunderstanding that passage, you're going to say, no, wait a second. Um, if that is true, then what about this? What about what Paul said over here? How does that match with, with what you're saying? Okay, so you're that's a skill to be developed, right? And you've got to have, uh, you've got to have some understanding of this subject, and then uh, you're going to try to reach one-mindedness about the author's intent. Okay, this is central to the, to the task, of, of uh, really uh, interpreting passages correctly, is to try to reach one-mindedness about the author's intent. Once a group, uh, any group discussing the scriptures. <coughs> Can, can agree on this is the author's intent, then that, that's half the battle. That's, that's a group that is, that is headed towards real life transformation. And then they're going to identify the main issue <clears throat> for your discussion. Okay, this, He's saying this is the early stage of the discussion. We're going to understand the scriptures, and we're going to nail down this is actually the, the issue that we really want to discuss together. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then movement three is engaging the Socratic method. And I am at, well, let's keep going. Um, engaging the Socratic method. First of all, you're going to pursue truth in community. Pursue truth in community. What a beautiful picture that is. This is letting the word of Christ rich, richly dwell within you, uh, the church community. You're going to explore all facets of the, is of the main issue within reason. Um, okay, now that's my, that's my, one minute warning, wrap it up, okay? Um, I'm going to come back to this because this is the heart of the Socratic method is, is pursuing truth and community and exploring all facets of the main issue. And, and so um, this, this uh, is, is really uh, the heart of the actual discussion itself. So I'm going to come back to this and continue discussing the skill of leading a discussion. All right. I uh, again, I don't. I, I'm not aware of too many people who have, who have uh, developed a, a resource for um, teaching people how to lead a discussion. Um, so I was really excited when I when I came across this this resource and the and it's referenced down there at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so I want to I want to walk you through this uh, uh, entirely, and um, we're just out of time today. We'll continue um, talking about the teaching process uh, next week. And uh, so sorry that I couldn't be with you in the classroom today, uh, but I hope you've all had uh, a, a good time with this and in thinking about uh, this important issue of the teaching process and teaching the Bible. And uh, I hope you have a great week, and I'll plan on seeing you next week. Next Monday, let me know if you have any questions about the upcoming assignments that we talked about earlier. All right? So...